right? You are doing a great job by staying at home. You just don't realize. We know that these frontliners are out there. They're doing their uh, vital role in this kind of um, uh, war. But you, um, if you stay at home, you are also helping those frontliners and you're helping the world to be protected. All right? So that's the saddest part right now that we are, United States as number one in having this uh, COVID-19. Um, it's, it's really sad. It, it's sad in everybody, you know. So we're hoping and we're praying that everything will be okay soon. Okay, we're hoping. So, um, but of course, we are, we are a warrior. So we are able to conquer this. All right, <clears throat> let's finish this uh, med search, muscular skeletal. So in muscular skeletal system, always remember that we have these 206 bones, okay? 206 bones, human bones. It's not 207, 260, 280, no. We are not dinosaurs, okay? We have 206 bones. Now, in muscular skeletal, it gave us support, protection, movement, and of course, this mineral storage, particularly calcium. We have hematopoiesis or hemopoiesis. The hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis is production of RBC. Remember that the kidney or kidneys produce uh, erythropoietin. The erythropoietin commands the bones to produce RBC. Whatever the structure of our bones, all right, functions will be there. Imagine this. If you or me, we don't have this musculoskeletal. If we don't have a skeletal system, what will happen to us? We will not be able to stand. Or we will not be able to support our internal organs. We will be look like a jellyfish. All right. Probably I will be in prone position and teaching you guys. So watch out, of course, how to protect our or maintain our muscular skeletal system. <clears throat> Hold on. So this. So muscular skeletal system, of course, whatever the structures, the the functions, of course, will be the same. Next, the joint. The other term for joint is what we call artro. That's the reason why the other term for joint is artro. So if there's inflammation of joint, that is arthritis. So there's inflammation of joint, that is arthritis. Now, look at this picture carefully. There is what we call ligaments. Synovial lining, synovial fluids. So that area, of course, should be maintained. If there's what we call a sprain, if there's a sprain, the affected area is your ligaments. If there's a sprain, the affected area is ligaments. The synovial fluids. Sometimes there are some excessive production of synovial fluids. That's why once you check your joint or your artro, hmm, it seems that there's accumulation of fluids. So what's going on? So probably there is some infection or probably, of course, it's an autoimmune condition that you are producing a lot of synovial fluids. So it needs to be checked. All right. So arthritis, inflammation of joints is prime. The affected part is ligament if they said that you have a strain a strain the affected area tendon so you have letter t tendon all right so tendons is affected area is strain ligaments <clears throat> Laboratory and diagnostic uh, examinations. Now, pertaining to this, any laboratory or any diagnostic or laboratory 
if there's visualization that they're going to perform, remove any metals. Again, any laboratory or diagnostic examinations that there is visualization, as much as possible, we remove metals. But if metals are implanted, we don't remove it. Again, if metals are implanted, we don't remove it. Okay? So, we have myelogram, we have nuclear scanning, MRI, CAT scan or CT scan, even the bone scanning. All right? Visualization of the joints. There is arthroscopy. So, visualization of the joint. There is arthroscopy. There is endoscopic microsurgery. So, from the name itself. Sometimes, of course, they are performing this, especially if there is what we call the slip disc. All right, microsurgery. Look at this picture carefully. So they have this fiber optic device that will be inched. All right, and they are performing the procedure. <clears throat> to make sure, of course, there's a good uh, circulation. There's no leakage of CSF. They're maintaining the position after the procedure. Just, um, if this is spinal cord area, Remember the log rolling rule, turning the patient as one unit to make sure. Okay. Next, we have this um, uh, synovial fluid aspiration. Like I said, if there's excessive production, to find out what's the main cause or what, what the organism that causes this excessive production. The EMG, electromyogram, it assesses, of course, our muscles, all right, if muscles will be contracted or has flaccidity or rigidity. Laboratory tests, we know this already. We talk about calcium, especially in our fluids and electrolytes. If calcium is low, hypocalcemia. Our muscles, if calcium is low, low calcium, muscles will be rigid. If you have low calcium, muscles will be rigid. Remember, low calcium, shivostic signs. BP cough, trozu. All right? Shivostex, trozu. Okay? We have this increased calcium. If you have high calcium, what will happen to you if you have high calcium? Flaccidity. So there will be a relaxation of muscles. There will be flaccidity or relaxation of muscles. ESR, we've been talking about ESR. ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. If muscles or bones are affected, if there's inflammation, ESR will be elevated. Again, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. If muscles or bones are inflamed, ESR will be elevated. Cardio, composed of muscles. If there's pericarditis, inflammation, ESR will be elevated. Arthro, joints, arthritis, inflammation, all right? Joints, bones, ESR will be elevated. Inflammation of muscle, muscles or musculo, then skeletal, if there's inflammation, Elevation of ESR. Lupus erythematosus, or what we call LE, they are checking this. If they are suspecting that you have this, what we call systemic lupus erythematosus. Systemic lupus erythematosus, SLE. The SLE is also known as collagen. The SLE is also known as collagen problem. All right, SLE is also known as collagen problem. Now, in SLE, if this is collagen problem, your kidneys will be affected. If kidney is affected, we, we know what will happen. If the kidney is affected, the patient will have retention of fluids. No wonder. The patient, have, if they have SLE, they're going to have retention of fluids. They're going to have edema, the periorbital edema, facial edema. And some parts or different parts of the body will have edema, all right? 
So SLE. Now, what is the isolation pertaining to SLE? Since infection control is very common, and there's a lot of questions pertaining to infection control, SLE, they are on reverse isolation. They are at risk to infection. Always remember, if someone is at risk to infection, there is what we call immunocompromised condition, and of course, they are what we call having pancytopenia. What is pancytopenia? Pancytopenia, everything will be low. Your WBC is low. All right? RBC is low. Platelet will be low. Pancytopenia, everything will be low. Pina, 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 low. All right? Next. Rheumatoid uh, factor. This one is, they're getting this. If you have rheumatoid problem, always remember, every time that you see the word rheumatoid, rheumatic, there is bone involvement or muscle involvement. Okay? Rheumatic heart disease, rheumatic fever, rheumatoid arthritis. So there's bones and muscle involvement. Uric acid, you're familiar with this. But do not raise your hands if you experience one. Uric acid, this is for the patient with gout. Very good. All right, we will be talking about gout later. Now, let's talk about rheumatoid arthritis as well as osteoarthritis. So we have here RA, rheumatoid arthritis, and we have OA. Let's compare them. This RA, the RA, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic, systemic, chronic and systemic. Osteoarthritis, it's localized, uh, localized. Where is that? Usually, all right, localized only. If my left knee has that, all right, if my left knee has osteoarthritis rarely that my right knee will have that usually stress on weight bearing uh joints okay related to obesity ouch so uh, rheumatoid arthritis chronic and systemic it's systemic and symmetrical when you say systemic and symmetrical if my right shoulder has uh, rheumatoid arthritis my left shoulder will have that as well if my left hand has rheumatoid arthritis, my right hand will have rheumatoid arthritis as well. Systemic and symmetrical. All right? Now, this is also considered as autoimmune disorder. For our textbook, for diagnosis, it's autoimmune disorder. All right? Osteoarthritis related to obesity. Let's put it that way. Osteoarthritis is related to obesity, stress on weight-bearing joint, and it's localized. Localized. Rheumatoid arthritis related to autoimmune, all right? Chronic systemic condition. So there is what we call exacerbations and remission. There's remission and then exacerbate. That's the reason why they said during remission, during exacerbation, what management should be used. You must alternate cold compress and warm compress. Cold and warm compress will be used alternatively. Next, limited range of motion. They go they're going to have morning joint. Okay? They're going to have morning joint stiffness. So morning joint stiffness. Keep that in mind that we are talking about joints here, muscles, okay? Morning joint stiffness, all right? So if they have morning joint stiffness, in the morning, they cannot, they cannot move or they're having a hard time moving their fingers or they're having a hard time moving their joints, okay? Why is it that there's morning joint stiffness? Because in the morning, 
it's kind of cold. So you need to give or apply warm compress. Warm bath, warm compress, all right, will help the patient with morning joint stiffness. So rheumatoid arthritis, symmetrical, systemic, okay, autoimmune condition. While the other one, the osteoarthritis, localized, weight-bearing joint, all right? For this two, for this two, the diagnostic tests are almost the same. Laboratory, almost the same. But of course, if this is osteoarthritis, uh, they, they don't usually get the rheumatoid factor, but sometimes they are doing to assess uh, the patient. ESR, RF, and of course, synovial fluid aspiration. <clears throat> when it comes to medication, here are the favorite of NCLEX when it comes to medications pertaining to musculoskeletal problem in general, pertaining to musculoskeletal problem. One, you have the NSAIDs, you have the aspirin, and of course, steroids. NSAIDs, aspirin, and steroids. So, musculoskeletal medication, favorite of NCLEX, if there's inflammation, if there's pain, either of these three. NSAIDs, aspirin, and steroids. Why not they are, they are not giving any acetaminophen or Tylenol? Why is it that they are not giving Tylenol? All right, why? Because Tylenol doesn't have anti-inflammatory effect. So Tylenol doesn't have any anti-inflammatory effect. While your NSAIDs, aspirin, steroids, they have anti-inflammatory effect. They have analgesic effect, all right? Tylenol doesn't have that. Tylenol has anti, um, they have analgesic effect, but no anti-inflammatory, all right? Now, are they GI irritants? Yes. They are GI irritants. Now your COX2 inhibitors is another form of NSAIDs. COX2 is another form of NSAIDs. So this is also NSAID. But the COX2 is non-GI irritant. COX2 is non-GI irritant. The NSAIDs, the one that we know, remember that we have the Advil, Aleve, Motrin, okay, those ibuprofen, they are COX1 here. If the NCLEX, if the NCLEX will be giving us information pertaining to, or questions pertaining to, N, to NSAIDs, okay, we have the COX1 and the COX2. The COX1, this is the most common NSAIDs that we know, all right? Your Motrin, your ibuprofen, these are COX1 GI irritant. You know what to do if they are GI irritants, all right? Give meal or give food something first on their tummy before giving any NSAIDs or COX1. If this is COX2, this is non-GI irritant. Example of COX2 is salicoxib, or also known as Celebrex. All right, understand that the most common NSAIDs that we have are GI irritants. But the salicoxib, celebrex, or COX2, they are non-GI irritant. Now, will the NCLEX use COX1? They use the exact word COX1. Rarely. They just use NSAIDs. If they are using the word NSAIDs, all right, that's GI irritant. Okay? If they are using the word COX2, that's, uh, that's non-GI irritant. And, of course, example of that is your salicoxib or... Celebrex. 
Remember the three medication NSAIDs, aspirin, and steroids. So rest, exercise, range of motion, heat, or warm compress, hot packs, and of course we have the Heberdens versus Bouchard's. The Heberdens, these kind of nodes, observe these nodes. All right. Is, oh, these are the nodes for osteoarthritis. These are the nodes for osteoarthritis. If our patient with RA, they have morning joint stiffness, our patient with OA, they have this what we call Bouchard's and Heberdens. Where to find the Heberdens? The Heberdens, of course, is distal, close to your nail, so distal. H, high Heberdens, high way. If this is Bouchard's, middle, middle bone here, right? Close to the palm area, close to the body, proximal. So distal is the Heberdens. Bouchard's is proximal, all right? They have those nodes for our osteoarthritis. With this picture, this is close to the fingers. And this is distal. H, highway. So that is Heberdens. Okay? So these are Heberdens. Uh, before we jump to that, um, ankylosing spondylitis. Let's go back to your um, OA, uh, RA. Remember RA? Medications. We have NSAIDs, aspirin, and of course, steroids. We have NSAIDs, aspirin, and steroids. Okay? So, they are all GI irritant. We can use for exacerbation as well as remission. So, remission and exacerbation. We can use warm compress and cold compress. Okay? Now, they have morning joint stiffness. If there's morning joint stiffness, what are we going to do? We can perform warm compress, okay? Now, we have this what we call Felty syndrome. The Felty syndrome, the Felty syndrome, the patient will experience enlargement of the liver and the spleen. Felty syndrome, enlargement of the liver and the spleen. So that is what we call hepato spleen megaly. Why do they have felty syndrome? Why do they have hepato spleno megaly? The reason why Remember, if you have this severe rheumatoid arthritis, the affected areas are bones. Our musculoskeletal system, it's a systemic problem. So if you have hepat if you have felt the syndrome, your RBC will be affected as well. Remember that your bones, commanded by erythropoietin, to produce RBC. So if there's less RBC, your liver and spleen maintain the volume of your hemoglobin. That's why they are working hard. So hepato is splenomegaly. They're going to have this what we call enlargement. All right? Next. The Sjogren syndrome. Patient with Patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis are going to have Sjogren's syndrome. What is Sjogren's syndrome now? Sjogren's syndrome, you have severe dryness. You're going to have severe dryness. So if you have this severe dryness, of course, dryness of the eye, dryness of the mouth, and even the vulva or the vulva, the genital area will be dry. You know what to do if there's severe dryness. You can enhance fluids or increase fluids oral care down there of course you can apply cream 
but make sure when you are applying cream, it should be water-based cream. It's not alcohol-based, all right? So Sjogren's syndrome, there will be severe dryness. So watch out for that and manage it. You know what to do. The rheumatoid arthritis, do they need rest? Yes. Do they need rehabilitation? Yes. Do they need anti-inflammatory analgesic? Yes. We have the NSAIDs, aspirin, and steroids. They have morning joint stiffness. Yes. So how to manage? Warm compress, warm bath. All right. So you have felt this syndrome, hepato, is splenomegaly. So enlargement. So what are we going to do with that enlargement? How are we going to manage that? Watch out with the manifestation of rupture. Okay, bleeding will occur. Right? Remember the function of your liver. That's your primary organ there. So make sure you know the function. Sjogren syndrome. Sjogren syndrome, you have severe dryness. You know what to do if there's severe dryness. Okay? Next, the ankylosing spondylitis. The ankylosing spondylitis, there is what we call fusion. When you, uh, let me just show you the picture here. Look at this. There will be fusion of this is spinal, uh, spinal uh, area, the vertebrae. So there will be fusion. As you can see, our spinal cord here. Okay. Look at the um, intervertebral, intervertebral disc, the blue colored here. And then, of course, here. Now, if there is ankylosing spondylitis, there will, there will be fusion of the vertebra. There will be compression of this uh, cushion or intervertebral disc. And look at this. If there's fusion, look at the structure or the feature of the patient with ankylosing spondylitis. They will be having a hard time standing erect. All right? Aside from that, of course, they're going to have this back pain. I should notice they're wearing mask because now the bone is affected, the spinal cord is affected, they will be at risk to infection. Remember the functions of our bone. All right? Next, so medical management, exercise, balance with rest, heat application, gait enhancers, of course, we have canes, walkers. Still, we have those medications. We have NSAIDs, aspirin, and steroids. GI irritants? Yes, they are GI irritants. They can perform surgery, osteotomy, or joint replacement. Gout. Oh, do not raise your hands if you experience one. For those people, of course, who love to eat, they have this uh, manifestation especially if they cannot metabolize purine. Let's simplify gout. Purine, purine is another byproduct of protein. Purine is another byproduct of protein. Meaning to say, this component of protein that you cannot metabolize, there is a formation of this what we call the urates. The formation of urates that is commonly of, that commonly occurred in your great toe irritates the nerves, all right? The urate crystals irritates the nerves, and there will be pain. Now, where does purine came from? Protein. So, if the patient has gout, do we need to give a lot of protein? Any food that are high in protein could be high in purine. So make sure you're not giving too much protein to this patient or else they will have this uh, gout or they will have urate crystal uh, accumulation in their tophi and there will be irritation, there will be pain, inflammation will occur. So it's a metabolic uh, disease resulting from an accumulation of uric acid in the blood caused by an ineffective metabolism of purines from protein, primary, hereditary factor, secondary, use of certain drugs, complication of other diseases, affects men more frequently than women, does not occur before puberty in males or before menopause in females. Okay, so look at this picture. 
usually occur, of course, in in the um, toe in, in the great toe. So look at this inflammation, and it's painful because it irritates the nerve. All right, and look at this. Oh my goodness. If that is a, your grandparent or your parent, all right, how come that you waited until that gout get bigger before look before um, giving assistance or giving uh, management? We don't wait until the gout get bigger and bigger, all right? So there will be excruciating pain, edema, inflammation, most common in great toe, all right? Tofi or tofus. So tofi, not tofu. So diagnostic tests, of course, uric acid tests, radiographic studies or visualization, synovial fluid aspiration, management favorite of NCLEX, called chisin. What else? Allopurinol. Indomethacin came out. Okay, the endomethacin came out or endocin. Keep this in mind that we are managing muscular skeletal with NSAIDs, aspirin, or steroids because they have anti inflammatory effect. Now, if the patient has this gout, the colchicin is anti gout medication. The colchicin has analgesic effect, anti-inflammatory. They have anti-inflammatory and anti-uric acid. The complete set, okay? It's a complete set. Now, when you talk about allopurinol, Allopurinol, as well as the other medication known as probenicid. Allopurinol probenicid. They have anti-uric acid effect. So if they have anti-uric acid effect, they don't have this anti-inflammatory effect. So meaning to say, so, anti-uric acid or anti-inflammatory, they don't have any anti-inflammatory effect. So, meaning to say, this medication must be combined with any other medication that has anti-inflammatory effect. That's why allopurinol or probenicid can be combined with NSAIDs. Okay? So, can be combined with NSAIDs because NSAIDs, they have anti-inflammatory effect. Now, the one that came out in NCLEX was endomethacin. The endomethacin, or also known as endosin, that medication is NSAIDs. Okay? That is NSAIDs. Endomethacin or endosin is an NSAIDs. All right? So it can be given. The take note, called chisin, has a complete set. No need for combination with other medication. Allopurinol probenicid needs combination, needs another medication. So, anti-uric acid, but it needs anti-inflammatory, which is NSAIDs. NSAIDs, we have endomethacin as an NSAID as well. Now, Aside from those management, aside from medication, we can also give fluids. For the patient with gout, increase fluids. The more fluids, the better. If they eat a lot of purine food or protein, they need to drink a lot of fluids. So fluids, fluids, fluids. If they cannot control their diet, drink a lot of fluid so they can flush it out. Now, when it comes to diet, Low purine diet. So decrease purine. So what are those purine-rich food? 
any food that are high in protein will be high in purine. Okay? Any food that is high in protein will be high in purine. So if you would like to have low purine diet, you must have low protein diet. Are you going to give a lot of organ meats? No, because organ meats is high in protein. Any food that is high in protein. Sardines, fish. They have sardines, herring, salmon. Those are high in protein. They have protein. So most fish, they are high in protein. So decrease protein, decrease purine. All right? So in your select all and apply question, once you see this, this food is high in protein, you know that it's high in protein, automatically, all right? Do not give this to the patient with gout because purine is another component of protein. Next, osteoporosis. We know this already. If you have osteoporosis, you have brittleness of the bone. You will be at risk to, to a fracture, all right? So be careful. So, back ache, pores, and brittle bones, and they're going to have this do what you hump. Some people, they have that kind of manifestation, especially elderly, okay? They have this do what you hump. So, reduction of bone mass, most common in women, ages 55 to 65, because there's a decrease of this um, estrogen level. The estrogen level helps, or estrogen, helps in absorption of calcium, all right? So contributing factors, immobilization, steroids, because steroids, of course, depletes our bone and decrease absorption of calcium, high intake of caffeinated uh, beverages, diet, low in calcium, high in protein, smoking, and of course, sedentary lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle. So right now we are in quarantine or should I say lockdown, or a stay-at-home policy, all right? So sedentary lifestyle, we just sit down, then walk a little bit, then sit down again. So make sure we are moving around as well, all right? Cleaning our backyard, our garage, like our garage, we need to clean that. All right. This is what we call the do a home. The patient, of course, had this manifestation, and basically, of course, there will be pain. If they have pain, basically they will be having a hard time breathing. So patient or elderly who have this, make sure you maintain the airway and breathing as well as circulation. So in osteoporosis, all we need to do is to prevent it. If we have this, we cannot, uh, uh, we can slow down the progression and prevent, of course, further injury. So calcium can be given weight-bearing exercise. So dumbbells, weight-bearing exercise. If you run, jogging, that is weight-bearing exercise. Swimming, no, that's not weight-bearing exercise. No swimming, all right? Estrogen can be given. Example of estrogen is Evista that came out in NCLEX. Or well, Evista can be given. There is Alendronate, Posamax. Any medication that ends with Dronate, any medication that ends with Dronate is for osteoporosis or for our musculoskeletal. Diet high in milk, a diet, of course, dairy products like milk, and of course, limit caffeinated drinks. All right? Now, Let's talk about alendronate. Dronate, dronate medication. Fosamax. Dronate or alendronate or Fosamax. What is the side effect of this medication? The side effect is gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, all right? Meaning to say, if the patient will be taking Fosamax, they need to maintain the position like preventing to have this GERD. So what's the position? 
sitting upright. After, after taking the medication, sitting or sit upright. This one came out in your NFLEX. But of course, it's not directly saying sit upright. But the NFLEX, the NFLEX said which among the following intervention or which among the following activity is correct after taking a lendronate. And the answer was of the nurse observed the patient sitting in a chair reading magazines. After taking a lendronate, the patient was sitting in a chair and reading magazine. Is that sitting upright? Yes. All right. And then, of course, in select all the reply, they put 30 minutes. That's why sitting upright for 30 minutes. Next. What else? This is being given a day. So once a day only. With once a day with one full glass of water. With one full glass of water. When are they going to take this? In the morning. All right? In the morning. And then, of course, empty stomach. It came out in NCLEX that this one, uh, alendronate came out, uh, alendronate came out, and of course they said, okay, when is the best time to give this? There is no morning, there is no empty stomach in your NCLEX. There is no morning, there is no empty stomach in your NCLEX. But what they wrote there was, give this before breakfast. Before breakfast. So the best time to receive a lendronate is before breakfast. So there is no morning or empty stomach. But before breakfast, breakfast is in the morning. Before breakfast, empty stomach. So there is rewarding. So watch out for those rewardings. All right. So once a day, once a week. Uh, you may you may change this to sorry. You may change this to once a week. All right. So we with one full glass of water once a week, morning empty stomach. All right, before breakfast or sitting upright in thirty minutes. Okay. What a coincidence! They use this information. They use this information in their select select all the reply question. All right. So watch out for those Posamax. Next, osteomyelitis. Osteo, let's define this first. When you say osteo, means, it means bones. When you say maya, myo, muscles. So there's inflammation of bones and muscles. Osteomyelitis. Remember the ESR? So your ESR will be elevated again because there's inflammation. Your C-reactive, the C-reactive protein will be elevated again. Now, in osteomyelitis, staphylococcus are the most common cause, introduced through trauma. So probably there's trauma, there's wound, all right? So antibiotics can be given because there will be sepsis. That's why those patients with um, pressure sore, they have this stage four that you can see their muscles and bones. Some of them or most of them, they have osteomyelitis. So... If you're not going to give any antibiotics for this patient, they're going to have sepsis. So be careful about osteomyelitis. It may lead to sepsis. So make sure you give antibiotics. So signs and symptoms of infections, watch out. Okay? So radiography studies, bone scan, CBCs are cultures to find out what microorganism and what medication should be given. Antibiotics. Okay? If antibiotics is not effective, what will happen? They're going to cut it. They're going to amputate. All right? So if there's a wound, of course, and diet, high calories, protein, and vitamins. So 
for wound healing purposes. Why is it that we need to have high calories? We need to have high calories to have energy, okay? Protein, of course, for recovery, for wound recovery. Vitamins, we use vitamin C. It helps, all right, in the wound healing process. We have vitamin A, D, that's why you have A and D antibiotic cream, all right, for healing purposes. And of course, we are using zinc for healing purposes. So mineral, zinc, but vitamin A, C, D. Next, fibromyalgia. In fibromyalgia, this is the saddest part about this condition. The cause is unknown. So nobody knows what's the main cause of this fibromyalgia. Don't ask me because even them, they don't know. All right? So fibromyalgia. In fibromyalgia, there is what we call widespread pain. For example, if I have pain on my right eyebrow, all right, it will be radiated towards the left side. It will be radiated towards different parts of my body. It's a widespread pain. If I have pain on my little finger, it will be radiated towards my other finger and, of course, my hand, my arms, my shoulder, my neck, and all over my body. That's how fibromyalgia is. Most of the time, I'm using an analogy pertaining to this condition. If I have a tennis ball, if I have a tennis ball, this tennis ball that I'm going to throw against the wall, if I'm going to throw a tennis ball against the wall, this ball will be bouncing from different areas to the other. All right? It keeps on bouncing anywhere else. Same concept with your fibromyalgia. If you have fibromyalgia, you have pain in one area and it will be radiated towards different parts of the body. Now I'm thinking, if I have fibromyalgia and this is a wide, widespread pain, all right, it's depressing and surely I will not be able to fall asleep. I will have this anxiety. I will have this paranoia. I'll be paranoid. Oh my God, I have pain now. Oh, so it will be rejected again. So my life will change if I have this fibromyalgia. Now, there is what we call uh, generalized aching. So IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. There is tension, headache, paresthesia of upper extremity, sensation of edema to his hand if there is. And no specific laboratory or radiographic test for diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So patient education and reassurance. Teach them, of course, about relaxation technique. So the way we talk to them, the way we deal with them, all right? Make sure that they are not going to be anxious. Alleviate whatever anxiety that they have. We can give exercise or teach them, of course, relaxation and exercises, and of course, antidepressant medication. Now, what antidepressant medication should be used for this patient? We can use this what we call TCA, your tricyclic antidepressant medication. Tricyclic antidepressant medication. You have your, of course, you have um, Sinequan, it's part of your antidepressant. You have your Tofranil. You have Elavil. And you have your Pamilor. Pamilor. Pam. Like Pam, Pam, Pam. So Pamilor. Okay? So you have your STEP step. For tricyclic antidepressant medication, we have the Sinequan. We have Tofranil, we have Elavil, and we have Hamilor. Okay? Antidepressant. Can they receive any other pain medication? Yes. They can receive an, uh, medication. They can receive NSAIDs. They can receive narcotics. Can they receive anti-anxiety? Yes. They can receive anti-anxiety. You may give Valium or Diazepam. 
all right? So it's really sad to have fibromyalgia, all right? It's really sad. Just um, let them understand that their situation is not, um, it's not unique from other people. So they will understand that they are not alone. Of course, um, make sure you alleviate their anxiety and deal with them, all right? Next. Surgical intervention for total knee or total hip replacement. So why is it that we need to replace our knees and our hip? Sometimes if there's a fracture, sometimes due to osteoarthritis, weight bearing joint. So the weight on our right left knee or right knee. So they need to change that because it's already weak and there's fracture. Okay, so they replace it. As they replace it, of course, you will be needing rehabilitation. Aside from the rehabilitation part of your recovery, the diet must must change. There must be a light a um lifestyle change. All right, when it comes to diet, when it comes to other things, because you have this a uh, replacement. Now, in knee replacement, in knee replacement, after the procedure few hours or uh, a day after they need to have rehabilitation the pain medication will be there diet will be there and of course rehabilitation rehabilitation they're going to put this in what we call c p m the c p m is what we call the continuous the c p m is what we call the continuous passive motion device so the cpm is the continuous passive motion device so what are they going to do if this is the knee they're going to place a device and the knee of course will be flexing the knee will be flexing extend that extend that then flexion all right extension flexion extension flexion so the rehab or the physical therapist are the one who will be pro programming that or will set it up for the patient now question in amplex was the patient has cpm or is on cpm it's it's performing its extension and flexion okay now the patient will be eating the patient will be eating. If they're going to eat, you need to stop the machine. You're not going to remove it. You need to stop the machine. The question was, in what position, all right, of the leg, are you going to turn the machine off? The leg must be in extended position. Once you turn it off, extended position. Do not turn it off in a flex position so it must be extended position all right cpm machine next so positioning is very important alignment is very important because the knee all right the knee of that um uh, that patient must be aligned to the flexion part or the the area where the machine usually flexed next the hip arthroplasty or total hip replacement you know the reason why they have this replacement probably there is a fracture remember the head here yeah. the head of the acetabulum all right so a touch to this uh, pelvic area and now if there is a fracture they need to replace that so hip arthroplasty there are big no-nos if there's arthroplasty or hip arthroplasty. So no bending, no stooping, right? No crossing of legs. So arthroplasty management, nursing intervention, if there's hemovac, so it will create an autosuctioning. So make sure you drain that and measure, give oxygen, incentive spirometer, anyone who undergone or after surgery if they are awake perform this incentive spirometer 
Remember, the incentive is pyrometer. You need to breathe in. You need to suck it in. Breathe in in order for your lungs to expand. All right? Do not blow on that incentive is pyrometry. So cough and deep breathing. Record INO. Bed rest for 28 to 48 hours. Change of dressing. Diet as ordered. Remember the diet after surgery. Start with liquid. Okay? Start with liquid diet. Neurovascular checks. What is neuro neurovascular checks? When you say neurovascular, it's not neurological. Okay? Neurological is with regards to the cognitive status. When you say neurovascular, it's with regards to the circulation. All right? So, neurovascular is with regards to the circulation. So, this is the time that you are going to use your CMS. What is your CMS? Circulation, motion, and sensation. Circulation, motion, and sensation. All right? So after surgery, hip surgery, knee surgery, you ask a patient, can you wiggle your toes? If they are able to wiggle their toes, you assess the motion. You check the capillary refill, maybe on their toes, less than three seconds, there's capillary refill, that's a good circulation, all right? You pinch, you stroke, and they are able to feel that, that sensation, okay? And CMS, circulation, motion, sensation, or also known as neurovascular checks, is being used for our musculoskeletal disorders. So whatever musculoskeletal fracture, you check CMS. Cast, you check CMS. Hip surgery, knee surgery, you check CMS. All right? So in your MPLEX, look for CMS, circulation, motion, and sensation. Well, circulation, it's mottled. It's, it's cyanotic or pale in color. Hmm. The patient was unable to move the legs. That's, that's motion. Okay? The patient feels numbed. There's tingling sensation. The, so that's sensation. So watch out for that. All right? CMS. So maintain position of operative area. So this is hip surgery. So what's the position? Away. Abduct. All right? So there must be abduction. So away. All right? So abduction. Now, physical therapy will initiate ambulation and prescribe routine encourage fluid intake. Anti-embolism stockings. Anti-embolism. So anti-embolism stockings, you're going to wear that before getting up out of the bed. Again, anti-embolism stockings. You must wear that before getting up out of the bed. If the patient is sitting down in a chair, that's wrong, okay? You need to put the anti-embolism stockings while the patient is on a bed, all right? Avoid adduction. Do not put them together. Legs must be away from each other, abduct. That's why you have this, what we call uh, abductor pillow or wedge, okay? Encourage fluid intake and high fibers. Use toilet riser to prevent hyperflexion. The toilet riser. If they are in the bedside commode, toilet riser. Okay? Fractures. Fractures. There is, of course, uh, the continuity of the bone is being altered or impaired. And, of course, having fractures, sometimes there's pain, severe pain. And, of course, there's bleeding. So watch out for those bleeding. Mm -hmm. Severe pain, inability to move the leg voluntarily, shortening, or external rotation. If there's fracture, external rotation. Sometimes internal rotation. If you're going to carry the baby, all right, one leg is longer, the other leg is shorter. Okay? So the shorter leg, that's a fractured or dislocated area. Once you carry the baby again, aside from the level of their legs, you check the gluteus, 
the gluteus area. If one gluteus is higher, the other one is lower, the higher gluteus or buttocks, that is the fractured or dislocated site. All right? And we are only doing that assessment carrying for pediatric only. We can't do that for adult or even elderly. All right? Now, look at carefully your, your uh, types of fractures. You have this oblique. You have the comminuted, comminuted. You have this spiral fracture, and you have this compound. Hmm. And look at the compound. Your skin is not intact anymore. So this is what we call open fracture. If the skin is not intact anymore, that's open fracture. Okay? Now, in the event, in the event that there is fracture, there's a possibility of bleeding. And if that is close fracture, that blood retains on that area. So if there's continuous bleeding, there's a possibility of compression nerves as well as tissues, right? So that blood will compress those muscles, nerves, and tissues that may lead to compartment syndrome, okay? But later on, we're going to talk about that. If that's open fracture, of course, the blood will come out, okay? Now... What are the what are the traction that we can use to maintain the alignment and to prevent further complication? For now, we have this box traction. We also have Russell traction. What are the things that we need to remember for those type of traction? This is your box. All right, your box traction. In box traction, check out the heel of the patient. In box traction, you must check out the heel of the patient. Why? You are maintaining the alignment and the heel of the patient, of course, has pressure that there's a possibility of irritation. So make sure, of course, you check the heel of the patient to find out if there's irritation or to prevent if there's irritation. We maintain the alignment to prevent spasms. Next, look at this Russell struction. In Russell struction, look at this. They have this what we call foot plate. Why is it that they have foot plate? To prevent foot drops. Again, they have foot plate to prevent foot drop. And look at the traction. The back of the knee is being compressed. The back of the knee is being compressed. So, what are the things to remember when it comes to Russell? There must be foot plate to prevent foot drop. Check the back of the knee. Check the back of the knee, the pop lithium. Check the back of the knee because we have this what we call pop lithium nerve. The back of our knee, we have the pop lithium nerve that there's a possibility of compression. So check out for that. The two things when it comes to Russell's, all right? Of course, for our, um, for this traction or any traction, make sure you maintain the alignment of your traction. Make sure the weights are hanging freely. The weights are hanging freely. It's not on the surface or not on the floor, not on the bed. It must be hanging freely. Maintain the alignment, okay? Never discharge, never discharge a patient with traction. Never discharge the patient with traction. Even the NCLEX will be telling you, which among the following patients should be discharged home? If they put the word stable patient with traction, stable patient with traction do not discharge them that's a tricky option 
the word stable, okay, but they have traction, okay? You cannot discharge the patient with traction because you don't have this Balkan or Balkan frame, the bed frame in your house, okay? And you will be needing a U-haul if you discharge the patient. All right, complication of fractures. One, compartment syndrome. Remember the compartment syndrome that I told you there will be of muscles, nerves, and tissues. If there's compression of muscles, nerves, and tissues, circulation will be altered or impaired. And of course, this part will die. This, this extremity will die. And once it dies, they're going to perform amputation. Okay? So, what's the best management? Fasciotomy. What is fasciotomy? You're going to incise the muscles. Once you incise the muscles, there will be enough room. You're loosening up. So you have to loosen the muscles that is so tight because of the bleeding inside or whatever the main cause of that compartment syndrome. All right? Fasciotomy is the best management. Another, another complication of um, fracture, like I told you, there will be bleeding. So watch out for bleeding. Hypovolemic shock. We've been talking about hypovolemic shock. What happened to the vital signs? This is shock manifestation. Blood pressure will be low. Pulse rate will be high. Respiratory rate will be high. Inverted triangle with letter S in the middle. It's not Superman, but it's shock. So shock manifestation, blood pressure low, pulse rate will be high, respiratory rate will be high. All right? So you know what to do if there's shock manifestation. What's the position? Trendelenburg position. Modified Trendelenburg with pillow. Shock manifestation, hypovolemic shock, we can give fluids. We can give blood. All right? And assess vital signs of the patient. Fat embolism, another complication if the patient has this fracture. So the emboli, the emboli, of course, is the one that travels, may go to the heart or lungs. If there is pulmonary fat emboli or embolism, of course, the patient will have this difficulty of breathing, and this is an emergency. They have irritability, restlessness, disorientations, Stupor, coma, chest pain, and dyspnea. So management, give fluids, steroids, digoxin, and of course, oxygen. Gangrene, another complication of fracture. Look at this. Oh my goodness. If there's fracture, there will be poor circulation. One of the complications, gas gangrene. If there's gas gangrene, of course, Necrotic skin at site, foul odor from one, and what we need to do? Excision of gangrenous tissue, give antibiotics. If the patient, of course, is not responding to whatever treatment, they can perform surgery. All right? Perform surgery. And the surgery is amputation. This one, oh my goodness. Scary. Next, thromboembolus. So for thromboembolus, of course, blood vessel is occluded by an embolus. Now, once it travels, it may lodge to different parts of our body, heart, lungs, and even to our brain. What we can do, we give anticoagulants. We've been talking about anticoagulants. We've been talking about heparin. We've been talking about coumadin. All right? Heparin can be given subcutaneously. Comadin can be given per oral or PO. Antidote for heparin is protamine sulfate. We've been talking about that. Protamine sulfate. Antidote for comadin, vitamin K. Vitamin K. What's the other name of vitamin K? Aquami phyton or aqua me phyton. 
The other vitamin K is what we call phyton. The diet. So aquamifyton or phytonidion is the antidote for comedin. Antidote for comedin. If you overdose a patient with comedin. Anticoagulants, the side effect is bleeding. Side effect is bleeding. So watch out for any manifestations pertaining to bleeding. Next is the skeletal fixation device. We know this already. Skeletal pin. All right. Cast. Remember the cast. We have this what we call quick drying cast. Quick drying cast. To so hold the cast. We don't hold the cast using our fingers. Right? Especially if this is wet. Because there will be indentation. Indentation. It's a big no-no. We hold this using the palm of our hands. Okay? Palm of our hands. So, if there's itchiness under the cast, itchiness under the cast, you cannot just get a scratch, a hanger, no. Knife, utensils, no. All right? What we can do, use a hair dryer or a blower. Hair blower. Right? Cold mode. It should be cold mode. Not hot or warm because your cast will, will melt. All right. We have different type of cast. The most popular in NCLEX is a double hip spike cast. Okay. The spike cast is maintaining the position of being abducted. Now, if this area has been broken, what you can do is to apply abductor pillow or wedge. Okay. Now, diet, what diet should be given? Remember, they are on hip spike cast. You may increase fibers because they are not moving. Increase fluids. And what else that we need to increase? Oh, we need to lower gas forming food. Lower gas forming. So gas forming food, you have of course your cabbage, broccoli, because if this gas forming, they're going to have bloatedness. All right. Traction with traction. The one that we talk about was your box traction and Russell traction. Remember the box traction, you check the heel. Your russell traction, you check the back of the knee, and there must be foot plate. Okay? Now, it maintains alignment, relieve pressure, maintain correct positioning, prevent deformities, relieve muscle spasm. We have two types, skeletal and skin. If there is skeletal traction, there is there are screws, pins, or tongs. All right. This picture. Look at that picture carefully. That's pediatric. Okay. That picture, that traction is what we call Bryant. Bryant. The Bryant traction. Look at this. What is your main concern? You check the buttocks. Buttocks must be hanging freely. The buttocks must be hanging freely. Okay? Buttocks must be hanging freely. Should not touch the surface of the bed. It must be hanging freely. Now, one leg is flex compared to the other. One leg is flex compared to the other. This is, of course, with regards to the circulation, maintaining the circulation. Now, this is pediatric. If you place them in Brian traction and you left, the moment you come back, they are hanging upside down. Oh, my goodness. So what you can do, of course, is to apply vest restraint. Vest restraint. So vest restraint is a restraint. 
who's going to sign the consent? The parents, not the patient. Remember your patient is pediatric. So the one who will be signing the consent is their guardian or parent. And the same thing, it's 24 hours, they need to remove that, they need to get another consent, all right? So if they are on vest restraint, they are on braille instruction, and remember that they are pediatric. If this is a toddler, of course they love to play. So make sure their toys is closer to them so they can play, all right? Next, this is your uh, box traction. Remember, our main concern, check the heel. This is your Russell traction. Make sure you check the back of the knee. Okay? Now, there is what we call Thomas splint. The Thomas splint uh, traction. The Thomas Spleen traction is almost the same as your Russell's, almost the same as your Russell. But of course, this traction here is closer to the groin area. Remember in Russell's, Russell's, it's at the back of your knee. But of course, if this is Thomas's spleen, it's closer to the groin area. All right. Next. They have those assistive devices, assistive devices. I wish we are able to have an actual demonstration, but we are on live streaming. Um, but maybe someday. So assistive devices. We can use our assistive device to maintain our balance. Okay, to maintain our balance. That's one major reason why we are using our assistive device. To maintain the balance. No, no putting, um, there's no weight bearing. We don't put weight bearing in our affected area. First, your crutches. What are the things that we need to remember when it comes to crutches? All right. We put our weight in our hands, not in the axilla. Do not put weight in the axilla. Why? If you put weight in the axilla, there will be a what we call brachial palsy. What do you mean by brachial palsy? There is compression of brachial nerve in the axilla. Okay? This is also known as crutch palsy. So crutch palsy. Also known as crutch palsy. Now, if you're going to use crutches, if you're going to use crutches, make sure Oh, you do not have that page. I will we'll send it to you. Okay. Yeah, for now, just write it down. All right. So, crutch or breakout palsy. So, assistive device, let's start with crutches. Look at this picture here. All right. So, look at that picture. You're going to start, study this by yourself, studying by yourself. If you're going to have this two-point gate, okay? So you have two-point gate, three-point gate, four-point gate, swing through. Or your tripod. Now, look at this. You must start here. Oh, this is your number one. This is your number two, three, four. Five. That's how, how to uh, look or how to follow this picture. Okay? So tripod position. So you have your tripod. This is your tripod. This is your, your crutches, your two-point gate. So you move your crutches. You move your crutches. And you move your opposite leg. Okay, so again, for two-point gate, you move your crutch, you move your crutch, and you move your opposite leg. Okay, so that's how to do that. So follow it. Okay, your three-point gate, 
is the favorite of MPLEX. Okay, maybe tomorrow we can we can talk about those watch walking. All right, so we can we can share this with you. All right, so three point gate. For now, it's more on um, discussion. So three point gate is the favorite of MPLEX. Why? The three point gate is the non weight bearing joint. Again, three point gate. This one, the three point gate is non weight bearing joint non-weight bearing joint the four point gate is wearing a weight bearing joint swing through is also weight bearing joint okay so we have those crutches but always remember that three point gate okay is a favorite of NCLEX non-weight bearing joint what are you going to prepare your arms prepare your arms because you're going to put your weight on the on, the, on your hands, not on the axilla. All right. Next, canes. If you are going to use the cane, for example, cane. This is your O. You see, near O. Opposite. Affected. Leg. So you're going to use your cane. For example, my cane is on my right hand. My cane is on my right hand. If I'm holding the cane, if I'm holding the cane, I'm going to move my cane together with my affected leg. My affected leg will be my opposite leg. So my cane is on the right side. My affected leg will be on the left side. So cane and then affected leg. All right, opposite affected leg. You're not going to move your your cane and your right leg. It should be cane and left leg, wherever is the affected leg. If my affected leg is on my right side, if my affected leg is on my right side, okay, my cane will be on the left side. So if I move my cane forward, I'm going to follow this with my opposite affected leg, which is my right leg, okay? That's why we have called cane, opposite, affected leg. Cane, opposite, affected leg. The walker, the walker was a favorite of NCLEX. They will be asking you how to use the walker. Keep this in mind. Using a walker, push, and then walk, push, and then walk. So push and then walk, all right? Using a walker, push, and then walk, push, and then walk, all right? Nurses or whoever, where are they going to stand? If the patient is in the walk, using a walker, standing using a walker, Right, the patient should be in the middle of the walker, holding the walker, push and then walk. The nurse should not should not stand behind the patient. Should not stand behind the patient. Where? Alongside. If the patient is walking and you are walking with a patient alongside. Okay? Not behind. It should be alongside. All right, those are the things we need to remember pertaining to those devices. When it comes to wheelchair, safety issue, before putting the patient in a walker, make sure it's locked. Safety issue, before putting the patient in the wheelchair, it should be locked. All right, wherever is the stronger side, the walker must be on that side. Wherever is the stronger side, the walker must be on that side. The patient has right CVA. If they have right CVA, where is the weak area? Left side, all right? So where's the walker, uh, where's the wheelchair should be placed? On the right side, so they can scoot themselves towards the stronger side, towards the walker. If you place them on the left side, they are weak on this side, then they cannot scoot themselves going to the walk, to the wheelchair. All right, remember it should be locked. All right, 
we will enhance this in in uh, with actual presentation. Um, I think it would be helpful um, if we have this like complete view, right? We will do our best. Maybe tonight we're going to uh, fix the camera so we can discuss with regards to just devices tomorrow. So you can fully visualize it. All right. No worries. We will do our best to help you reach your goal. All right. So keep those in mind. Our our uh, devices. We have crutches. We have canes. We have walker. We have wheelchairs. Okay. And we have you. All right. Let's talk about traumatic injuries. The carpal tunnel syndrome. The carpal tunnel syndrome. So remember your your thumb your index, your middle finger, and of course your ring finger, and of course this is your little finger. Your ring, right, very important, because there's no engagement. Just kidding. Your thumb, what's the main purpose of thumb? Thumbs up, or probably thumbs down, all right? And this thumb, of course, is responsible for grasping, mm -hmm. right? Responsible for grasping your index or pointing index mm -hmm. mark as well marking or marking your middle finger. What's the main purpose? Middle. <laughs> <laughs> Why are that? So, main purpose of the middle finger to support the tongue. All right, it supports the tongue. And of course, <laughs> this is for expression purposes, right? Expression purposes, they said. Without the middle finger, there's no peace. No, there's no peace sign. All right, so these three, your thumb, your index, your middle finger, these three fingers, okay, has its nerve. And of course, it's connected to this what we call median, the middle nerve. We have the ulnar, ulnar radial, and we have the median, all right? So the median nerve. If we've been using these three fingers, right? You make, what are the example that those activities, of course, will lead to frequently use of your three fingers? Maybe a hairdresser, all right? They are using this thing, all right? You're always in Facebook. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so there's a possibility of frequently use of these two fingers, and of course, the median nerve will be affected. If the median nerve is being affected, that is carpal tunnel syndrome. All right? So the carpal tunnel syndrome, compression of the median nerve. Now, here, the median nerve is being compressed, and there will be pain. The pain will be radiating to the arms and neck. That's why if there's pain radiating to the arms and neck, they elevate it. So if they're going to elevate it, it lessens the, the pain. So management, what are, what are the management that we can perform? They can put this what we call immobilizer, or we call this one as our splint. Okay, elevation, range of motion, or they can perform surgery. So the carpal tunnel syndrome surgery. In the carpal tunnel syndrome surgery, they they divert the nerve from this mid, uh, from this uh, finger or fingers, all right, to different nerves, not in the median nerve anymore. So they have an incision in this area, all right, and they they put or they connect the other nerve to to radial or maybe the ulnar. The usual complication is paralysis. But of course, most of the time, carpal tunnel syndrome uh, surgery is successful, all right? Next, we have the herniation of intervertebral disc. So herniation of intervertebral disc. This is also known as a slip disc, slip disc. So what happened? In a slip disc, there's pressure from the vertebra that compresses this is what we call disc or nucleus pulposus. The disc or nucleus pulposus compresses, compresses the root nerve. If it compresses the root nerve, it causes pain. If 
the slip disc occurred in your cervical area, there will be pain on the upper extremities. If this is in the lumbar area, the pain will be radiating towards the lower extremity. All right? Now, there is a pressure in your vertebra that compresses the, uh, the disc that herniate to the root nerve. That's why there's pain. So avoid having pressure. So if you get something from the trunk and you're bending and you carry something, ah, there will be a possibility. That's why body mechanics reflects our knees, straighten our back. All right? So rupture or lumbar cervical herniation may occur from lifting, twisting, trauma, or degenerative changes. So what's the management for this? They can perform laminectomy. Now, what is laminectomy? Laminectomy is removal of the lamina. Where is the lamina? Let me just move this slide going back. So, here. The lamina, look at this root nerve. That's a root nerve. The lamina are this. They're going to remove the lamina. Okay? Laminectomy. So that even though it's herniate, it herniates, okay? Even though it herniates, it will not uh, compress against the lamina. All right? So laminectomy. And remember, laminectomy is a spinal cord surgery. And you know the rule of the thumb if this is a spinal cord surgery. We we'll turn the patient from one side to the other or we perform this, what we call log rolling. All right? as a unit. Okay, let me just finish this uh, uh, tumors. So, patient with bone tumors, remember that our bones has capillaries, arteries, vessels, right? If there's compression of our bone, it would be painful. The function of our bone give us structure, support, and of course, uh, storage of minerals, um, hematopoiesis, production of RBCs. So if there's a tumor, those functions will be impaired or altered. If they have a tumor, there will be pain. And most of the time, most of the time, it's not an ordinary pain, but it's a severe pain. All right? Aside from that, they're going to have this anemia. They're going to have fracture, edema, or discoloration of skin uh, at sight. Now, what's the management? Whatever type of uh, uh, bone tumor that we have, it may lead to pain. So what's the management? We can give pain medication. If there's a need for surgery, they perform surgery, radiation, as well as chemotherapy. All right? So... Watch out, of course, for severe anemia because of bone problem. All right. We will cut our discussion at this time because it's already lunchtime. And I know that you guys are hungry. So we, uh, when we come back after the break at 1 o'clock, we will be talking about amputation. And we're almost done. So amputation and then we have this scoliosis or spinal cord um, problem. And after that, we will be jumping to our mental health. All right? So enjoy your lunch. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
হ্যাঁ